All right, there we are. I clicked the button, Kirsty. We are live. Hello. Hi, Facebook land. <laughs> Good Hello afternoon. Hello there. <laughs> Welcome back to my couch. <laughs> I love being on your couch. <laughs> For coffee and conversation. And I was only just thinking um, earlier today that I feel like we need a jingle for coffee and conversation so that I can say, like, welcome to coffee and conversation. And then the jingle plays. Yeah, I think so too. I think we can have a look at it. <laughs> yeah. So if there's anyone out there in Facebook land that is like a musician, then they can maybe create us a jingle if they're watching. That would be great. And just send it on. Give us a jingle. We would love that. <laughs> We would love a jingle of our own. Yeah. <laughs> so it is that time of the afternoon where we do have coffee in hand and we are ready for coffee and conversation. Um, and today's topic of the day is overtraining, which is an interesting one. Um, we should probably introduce ourselves again just in case anyone's joining us for the first time before we start rambling on. So my sure. name's Corinne. Um, I'm the group fitness team leader and membership team leader at Firmwood Campbelltown. And Kirsty, over to you. Uh, my name is Kirsty. I do personal training um, at Firmwood and I do the Fit30 um, coordination. I am um, Cert 3, Cert 4 and Diploma in Fitness, um, Bachelor of Sport and Exercise Science and halfway through my master's of research and um, just an all-round lovable girl <laughs> <laughs> and a very long list of qualifications <laughs> yeah you wouldn't think it if you met me <laughs> <laughs> oh, we so would we so would um so as i mentioned today's topic is um overtraining so we wanted to have a bit of a chat about overtraining um, and a couple of um, conversations that I've had sort of over the last week are a bit like, why on earth are you guys talking about overtraining now? When okay. obviously the big push at the moment is be active, be active, be healthy, be well. Physical activity will improve your wellness. Um, but I think right now, people can go one of two ways. And I think we um, are seeing a little bit of both right now. So all this time stuck at home, obviously the gyms are still closed right now um, and we're stuck at home. So people are going to go one of two ways. They're either going to drop the ball and completely omit physical activity from their daily routines. And in that case, yeah, we are still saying, yes, please be physically active and please um, stay active. It's good for your wellness and all that sort of stuff. But there's a whole other group of other people, and I think I actually fall into this category, um, where we actually have a little bit more time on our hands. And when you've got time on your hands and you're a busy type of person, you're like, oh, I need to fill that time. And I'll fill that time with physical activity. And we are ending up actually being more physically active than we were before. Yeah. And this can happen. And, yeah, you're right. You will see it kind of move one of two ways because when we have such a big shift like this, it's very hard to maintain the normal that you had before. So you kind of resettle into a new normal. Um, the problem is, like all things, moderation and balance are key. Uh, generally, when overdoing something, you're obviously going to run into some issues. Um, now, in this instance, we're talking about people that, are taking it just that little bit further than either what they're currently kind of used to, let's just say, you know, pre-COVID, um, or they've they've really, really stepped it up on, on purpose. And sometimes it's accidental and sometimes it's on purpose. Um, but either way, the body is racing to catch up and, and sometimes it can't. And it does get to a point where it almost starts to reject your efforts um, and you will start to feel that, lack of progress um, and there are other things that you can look out for for overtraining but like all things it is about discussing it at the time because we've had this massive shift in our normal we're trying to settle into a new normal but we want to make sure that new normal is balanced as well mm. and that's really important so if we're looking at sort of strictly classifying overtraining it's not just about having a marked increase in activity, is it? Because we can all take an increase in activity, but we're not necessarily overtraining. So I guess what are the, how would you define overtraining? Okay, so I would more consider not so much the time, but the stimulus. So if 
say for instance, you work out at a low intensity five days a week, you might not notice much of a change if you go from a low intensity to a moderate intensity four to five times a week. The problem tends to come when people go from what they know to a much, much higher intensity and try to keep their frequency. And what happens is the body just doesn't have time to recover and it kind of starts to reject the notion. And then you see um, things that which we'll discuss um, in this conversation, but that's when you start to really worry about the the physicality of the stimulus that is that that person's experiencing, and that's the difference. It's not so much always about the time spent; it's just about the degree of stimulus that's happened and changed and quickly. Mm. We usually follow a progression, but sometimes when things shift like this, shifts happen quickly, and that's not necessarily the best way. And do you think it's only in relation to a shift in intensity or are we talking about a, a shift in stimulus as well? So say, for instance, if you were a swimmer and you suddenly mm -hmm. made the change to running and the oh, same definitely. thing happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we're definitely. looking at changes in intensity and big changes in intensity, mm -hmm. so jumps in intensity and perhaps mm -hmm. um, changes in the, the training mode as well. So you were in this bubble and all of a sudden you're training over in this bubble, which is completely different. Absolutely, 100%. Anytime there's a massive shift, um, whether it comes from the mood or the frequency, your body has to have some time to adapt to that. Um, yeah. And if, it's, if it doesn't happen, then you're going to run into some problems. And I mentioned that particularly because I think there would be a lot of people out there right now who all of a sudden when I don't have access to my gym, I'm going to run. Yep. But I didn't run before and I didn't yep. necessarily run outdoors before. <laughs> I yep. know that happened to me, which is why I mention it. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so those, those changes in what I used to do was over here and, and what I'm now doing is here can also result in, in overtraining as such. That's right. And you've got to remember your body would like to keep a stable balance on kind of what's happening to it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're... So if, yeah, as you mentioned, if you're a swimmer and then that's kind of low impact, but hard work from a cardiovascular perspective, and then you go on to running or hill climbing, stair running, skipping, these are high impact things. So those structures that exist within the body that have been exercising on low impact because they're in the water and buoyant are now mm. experiencing quite high impact. And that's a problem. So you need to be aware of that. Um, and that's where we find a, a lot of people that change from one sport to another have to have a period of adaption because being an athlete in general doesn't mean you can just move from different bits and pieces and just be okay. You still yeah. need to kind of work your way up to it and into it. And if you look at, you know, elite sports, like if we look at the Olympics, for example, you don't see the swimmers jumping out of the swimming pool and jumping onto the track and field, right? <laughs> no, because, no. You know, they're very they're conditioned for what they do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're absolutely. very conditioned for what they do. So it is really important to understand that if you have a change, whether it be from the frequency or the mode, whatever that stimulus is that changes, be aware that there is that need to progress into it mm -hmm. and not just jump straight in. So let's talk about some of the signs and signals of overtraining because just because you've trained, changed the type of training or your intensity doesn't necessarily mean that you're overtraining. So let's talk about some of the signs and signals. So what are the things that we should be aware of um, physically, mentally, all of those elements together? What should be aware of in terms of overtraining and how do we identify that we are perhaps in that overtraining sort of zone? Sure. So, I mean... There's quite a lot and they may not all apply to you and maybe some of them do, um, but you need to, let's kind of start from the top down. So first let's look at your mood. Is your mood kind of decreasing? Even though you're exercising when, you know, it should be stabilising your mood or at best kind of giving you a bit of a boost, if it's not, then we need to kind of think about that. Then we need to think about your sleep. What's happening with your sleep? Can you get to sleep? If you can't get to sleep, why? If you can get to sleep, are you sleeping too long? Generally, what you'll see in overtraining is this sleep disturbance. It's a change in what you would normally do, and you can't account for it in any other way. 
It's not that you've had coffee before bed and that's unusual. It's simply that your routine has been the same and now you can't sleep or now all you want to do is sleep. So that's something as well. Little niggles and pains. So these little niggles could be old niggles that are coming back or new niggles that just won't go away. So they just persist and persist. Sorry. <laughs> um, the so they just of live broadcast, right? I know, I know. <laughs> Edit. <laughs> um, cut there. So that, yeah, cut there. Um, these little niggles are things that just don't go away in that acute phase, which we would say about three months. If they're going on longer than that and you've you've kind of addressed them or you've done some stretching and things like that, you really probably need to consider that maybe the stimulus is too hard for your body at that time and maybe you need to cut it back. Mm. Other things like sickness. So if you find that you're getting run down all the time, you feel like you're always going to get the flu or you do so happen to get multiple colds or any other little things that crop up that say to you, oh, my immune system is compromised. Like for my son, he gets eczema. So his eczema will flare up when he's immune compromised, when he's run down. Mm. It's kind of really what you're looking for, very similar symptoms to just being run down. And you need to keep an eye out for them. Also, you'll see a decrease in performance. So if, for instance, at the start of the month, you're running, let's say, a kilometre in five minutes, that's fantastic. But you've been doing it every day. And when you get towards the end of maybe the second month, you can't get it done your times are getting worse and worse and worse, it's time to consider either taking a break or thinking about your training regime because performance should increase because you're working that stimulus. Mm. If it doesn't, it means the stimulus is kind of bringing you back and those things can all be that, that cataclysm of lack of sleep, lack of mood. Um, obviously, sex drive will probably go down. Um, Interactions with family members tends to change, a little bit frustrated. There's lots of little things to look out for. Injury is the biggest one. So when you're injured, the little niggles, okay, but when something big happens, like you rupture something, partial tears, all these sorts of things, that's something to be aware of, especially if you haven't had, you know, like in football where they have a really big impact and then they get injured. Okay, fair enough. But if you're just going for your run and all of a sudden you do, maybe you try to take off a little bit faster and you pull a hammy, oh, we've got a problem. So we really need to take a look at the whole picture as the whole system being run down. Mm. And they don't I all happen think, together. Um, I, was, I was about to touch base on that is I think identifying as well that some of these things might happen at different points for the individual. So I know for me um, I start to get physical symptoms before I start to see anything else. So I know I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago. Um, so obviously I'm working on um, different flooring here and the style of class that I am currently teaching is slightly different to what I would normally do. I'm prone to shin splints. Hello, what popped up? <laughs> In splints. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I know that those sorts of physical things start to appear for me first. I start to get mm -hmm. things like shin splints um, or very, um, you know, a lot of tightness through my hips, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. then starts to creep in the mental capacity for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I tend not to get so much affected in terms of sleep or mood disorders, but the way I approach my workout starts to change. So um, you've coached me quite a bit. So you know that once I'm in the game, I'm in the game, right? I'm there. I'm okay to go. I'm pretty committed throughout the workout. I yep. know if for me, one of the signs of overtraining is I, I can't get into that workout and I can't get my headspace in there. So yep. I'll be 10 minutes into the workout thinking, nah, I'm just yep. not here. I'm just not in it. My heart's just not in it. And I know that's not me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think and identifying how do I normally feel during my workout? How do I normally feel after my workout? And, and how does my body normally feel? How does my body normally react to this? And knowing the different things can appear at different times. Absolutely, yeah. And being aware of it is really important. And I would encourage everyone to try and keep themselves a little journal 
of how they're feeling, how they're sleeping, how hard their workout was so that they can subjectively kind of put that information on paper. And then later on down the track, if maybe they do the same workout, objectively come back and look at how it really was the first time you did it versus mm. now. How do you mm. feel? What were you, yeah, were you into it? Was your mood there? Were you happy? Did you have little niggles? Has your performance increased? Those sorts of things are really important. I would really honestly say that a lot of the time, if people just monitor what they're doing and how they're feeling, they'll probably notice a lot of these things before they become big issues. Yes. It becomes unfortunate when it's so far down the line that it really needs major addressing because mm. it has caused some some quite serious complications. So we, we've kind of discussed <clears throat> the signs and signals and we know now that they can be quite varied for the individual. They can yeah. be, you know, psychological, they can be physical. But what's happening in the body when we overtrain? Is there something okay. in particular that's happening in terms of hormonal response, um, you know, adrenals, all those sorts of things? What's happening there? Well, there's still there's still a lot of science to be kind of investigated into this area. But what there is is definitely this increase in your inflammatory cascade. So those little things, when they niggle, your inflammation increases in your body so it can go to that site, so it can fix that site, and then it comes back down again. But with constant exercise and stimulus that's above what it can heal, it stays elevated. And these sorts okay. of things aren't good for your vessels and other aspects of your well-being. So that's where your immune system now is elevated, then compromised, then you might get a little bit run down with a virus or something along those lines. So from an immune side of things, we know that that inflammatory cascade is really important. Um, and it does indicate when an athlete or a person is kind of overdoing it. When it comes down to the adrenals, we start to look at things like adrenal fatigue. And you may have heard it before, but it's just when no matter what you do, no matter how much rest you take, you mm -hmm. simply can't get up and go. You're just flat and exhausted. And those sorts of things can be really hard to come back from. And sometimes they can take months to sometimes years. And it's really important to not get to that point where you're entering into this adrenal fatigue because it's really hard to come back from it. Your body is this wonderful balancing machine and it's a whole part of homeostasis. So it wants to stay healthy. It wants to stay balanced. But when systems like the inflammatory cascade, the adrenals, thyroid, um, even down to the point where you've got your protein balances, so the amount of protein that you take in should meet the needs of the muscle. And if it doesn't, you get this net balance of a negative and you'll start to lose muscle mm. and we don't want that. So there's lots of systems in place to keep you safe that are internal. But when the external stimulus starts to, I suppose, muck around with those systems and it stays elevated or changed or manipulated for an extended period of time, we will start to see problems. Hormonally for women, it's a real problem because oftentimes with overtraining, it will happen in those childbearing years and in the kind of the years where you're putting down your bone mineral density, where you're building your bone mass, where you're building your muscle mass. All these sorts of things are really important from your hormonal perspective, from your sex organs, for reproduction. If these sorts of things are happening in these early years, then it really delays this and we see it sometimes with gymnasts they're, they're really small structure they don't eat a lot they train a lot and then they get to a point where they will lose their period and then all those things like bone building muscle building they're slowed down and compromised so by the time they reach the age of about 35 when those hormones start to come back down again as a natural part of aging they're kind of below optimal already mm. so then we see an issue there for them later in life leading into osteoporosis and all those sorts of things so it can have really major effects if left untreated and left too long mm. and that's really important so i guess it's really it's really about having a long uh, you know a long-term vision as well for your fitness i know it's very easy to to want to go in and go hard and you know have a very short-term fixed vision um and i think everyone at 
firm was the same. We've got to have such a long-term vision of health and fitness that it's not just about achieving either weight loss or, you know, a beautiful bicep or a six-pack. We really have to look at everything from such a bigger perspective and say, this is my body. <laughs> what am yeah. I doing to my body and how is it going to affect me in 20 years' time? And I think I'm now 40 and I'm only just realising that and I wish someone had have told me 20 years ago, hey, listen, in 20 years' time, you're going to start to worry about bone density and you're going to start to worry about um, your metabolism and you're going to start to worry about your hormone levels and you need to learn about it now. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, it's not really spoken about unless you're in the athletic community. Um, mm. They monitor it very closely, very, very closely. It's their daily ritual to log how they're feeling, how they've woken up, what their mood is, what their training schedule's like, what their training load's like. It doesn't happen in general population. And it's just as likely that women are just as determined to stay fit and healthy as athletes are to perform in their yes. sport. So it is unfortunate, but there are definitely some areas and things and those sorts of key insights that we can use in the general population to try and head it off before it becomes too much. Mm -hmm. Even um, even weight loss and weight gain. If you're doing the same training load and you're still gaining weight and nothing's changing in your food, it might be time to sit down and have a look. What's the stimulus like? And and if you're losing too much weight, that's a problem as well. Your body does need some time to adapt. Mm. Um, one to 1.5 kilos per week is given the standard as healthy. 1.5 can still be quite a lot and it's not expected to last every single week, week after week. So you do need to be careful if you're experiencing excessive amounts of weight loss. Worry that it might be time to have a look um, at the overtraining, maybe chat to someone, a professional, um, and see if there's something going on possibly with your diet or with your program. Yeah. And I think because of the the prevalence of health concerns in the community like diabetes, like obesity, like high blood pressure, like high cholesterol, mm -hmm. Because they are so prevalent, I think things like overtraining are very yeah. much overlooked because, you know, the, those things are prevalent. So everyone's be active, be active, be active, be active. Um, yep. But, yeah, things like overtraining are so often overlooked because of the prevalence of the other things. So you see someone who's out running five kilometres a day um, and everyone immediately thinks, oh, wow, that is, like, amazing and mm -hmm. great. It is amazing if that's what you're conditioned to do. But if your body's not conditioned to do it and it's having an adverse effect, then that's not so amazing. <laughs> and that's exactly right. Yeah, and, and rest is one of those things that's severely understated in terms of what it can do for you in terms of your performance. Mm. All your recovery will happen, obviously, outside of exercise, but during sleep. So if you're not sleeping well or you're not waking and feeling rested, then you've got to consider that your recovery is impaired. And that's recovery while you're sleeping. There's also other forms of recovery that you can do in the waking hours that can certainly help that process. And if you're so not doing that, no, if you're not doing that self-care, sleep alone is not enough. You've Especially already heading down the next path that I want to go down. <laughs> You're yep. already heading down there. You knew where I was going. We're in sync. So, yes, let's talk about overcoming, overtraining, how to avoid it and different types of recovery because there's so many different ways that you can do a recovery session. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously we've, we've kind of sort of touched on avoiding overtraining. So it's about building in intensity in terms of a training program. So we're not going to go from low intensity straight up to high intensity without some kind of conditioning period in between. Um, we want to make sure that in terms of the, the type of exercise that we don't jump from one to the other without being conditioned to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk recovery. Obviously, sleep is really important. What are the other the types of um, things that we can do to avoid overtraining? Anything else that you can think? Recovery, there's lots of recovery strategies. Whilst I think of a warm-up as 
exercise, I obviously also think of it as almost an active wake up so that it's not such a we're working out now. So yeah. that's really an important aspect of taking care of yourself. Moving through the exercise, going into the recovery side of things, the recovery that we know of it is where you've stopped exercising now and it's time to kind of cool those muscles back down. So an active recovery after exercise, sometimes during, depending on the type of program that you're doing, you'll do something called an active recovery. That is really important. The difference between skipping a 1,000 miles an hour and stopping dead versus skipping and then going slower and then going for a walk and then coming back down just kind of brings your heart rate down, brings your breathing rate down, and also moves the blood around those working muscles. Because while you're exercising, you're building up all of these byproducts of exercise. And when you stop, that skeletal muscle that's pumping that blood is now gone and your heart has to do it all. So it's always best transition into an active recovery first and then take yourself into the more passive recovery or the stretching. So we do stretching all the time, but I worry that people don't stretch nowhere near enough. <laughs> uh, and I, I believe we've harped on about this before at some point. Um, but the idea is for every workout that you do, you should be stretching. You should be stretching the muscle group that you've worked. And by stretching, it's not simply holding for 10 seconds and going, yep, I've done my quads. And the idea is to allow that muscle time to lengthen again. Because during that contraction, it's gotten tighter and tighter and tighter and more congested. And we want it to feel nice and okay, limber, not mm. knotted and congested. So we try and elongate that muscle after your exercise. So three times 30 seconds of a stretch and holding it at an intensity at about seven out of 10 is a good way to stretch, a six or a seven. If you take it too far and you try to overstretch it and kind of punish that muscle for giving you pain during the workout, it's not gonna work for you. The muscle is just gonna get tighter, it's gonna reject it, and you'll probably end up snapping something. Yeah. Other, other forms of recovery would be your foam rolling. So if you're not familiar with the foam roller, that can be a really good form of recovery. But definitely play around with it first, the foam roller if you're not used to it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it can be an important device. <laughs> it can be very intense. <laughs> so <laughs> take some time with that. You've also got other forms of exercise that are slower moving, that work on range of motion and elongating those muscles. Mm. Things like yoga, those sorts of things. Even Tai Chi to a point where you can move through a full range of motion. Pilates, these type of, although they're considered exercise because you will need to do some kind of static holds and those sorts of things, yep. they do also work by opening your muscle to its full range of motion and letting you stretch through some things. And they're not really restricted to this technique. That technique, there's a technique for everybody depending on where you're at. So you can always use that way. Um, there is a little bit of research about cold water immersion, but Mm, even on the athletic side, they're not really loving it too much. Mm. Um, it seems to be a bit higgledy-piggledy. Um, so there's that as well. But nutrition's a really important thing too. So making sure that you're eating the adequate amount of protein and carbohydrates to fuel the effort that you're putting into those workouts. If you're not fueling correctly, you are going to run yourself down. Obviously, if you're over-fueling, you're going the opposite direction and we don't want that either. So it is quite a, a game of cat and mouse where you'll exercise and then you try to eat to meet that and then you just keep moving in this direction. Mm. So and those are some we're of not the talking about weight loss there either. We're obviously no. weight loss um, or weight gain because we deal with both really in the club mm -hmm. um, are a, a different kettle of fish. We're really talking about maintenance of weight there when we're talking about nutrition too. Yeah, that's, um, that's 100%. And but you still need I'm to get your afraid, protein. Yes. <laughs> I'm Always. not afraid to say <laughs> right here and right now. Um, in terms of group fitness, I'm not afraid to tell everyone that the stretching that we do in group fitness is not adequate. Um, <laughs> let's yeah. put that out there. I love my group fitness dearly and I will argue that group fitness is one of the best ways for you to maintain your fitness until I hit my grave. But I can tell you now that the stretching that you do in group fitness is not 
adequate. We maximize the amount of time that you spend with us in group fitness class exercising and we stretch very minimally at the end. Um, it is a guide for you for mm -hmm. your stretching, you should really be trying to stretch for longer periods of time after your class. I know time restrictions, all those sorts of things come into play when we're talking about spending extra time after a class stretching. So I generally recommend to my participants that, yep, we're going to bring your heart rate down after the class and we're going to have a stretch. But when you're sitting in front of the TV of a night, stretch <laughs> stretch it's a good time Foam it's roll. a good time do all yeah. of those things there yeah yeah it is a good time def it we're definitely not holding stretches for long enough and you're 100 percent correct with what you say i mean we had to add in stretching to our functional sessions <laughs> as a purposeful session because no matter how much i said to my beautiful girls stretch 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 I would see eight of them walk away and two of them hang back and stretch. And I went, well, all right then, it's becoming a program. <laughs> mm, yeah. And, even and then, we do want to maximise the time they spend with us. Like we want to yeah. give them a great workout in the time, um, you know, they spend with us. So I can, I know why our programming has minimal amounts of stretching in it. But, yeah, it would be great if everyone stretched for longer. Yeah. I mean, because remember it's, it is all about balance and the domains of health are strength, cardiovascular, neuromuscular, flexibility, stability. We need those sorts of things to maintain a good overall picture. If your mm. flexibility is being left behind, you may have some issues with stability further down the track. It, it, it's yeah. all part of it. Um, so, I mean, that's probably a whole other conversation. <laughs> it's almost um, actually Deb and I are going to have a chat next week about um, sort of some fitness philosophy stuff and we're, we're sort of heading into that territory now where I'm a big fan of being a fitness, what I call a fitness chameleon. Okay. I think you need to be able to adapt to all sorts of things and what I, I hear frequently in the club, oh, no, I, I don't do yoga, I'm not flexible enough, which makes me laugh out loud. Yeah. Because the yeah. point of doing yoga is to improve your flexibility. It's, yeah. That's the whole point. I don't understand that argument, but that's a whole other argument for another day. But, yeah, and I think do it. we can avoid things like overtraining, um, fatigue and, all, and injury and all those sorts of things if we can become chameleons of fitness. So if you are as comfortable in a Fit30 session as you are a yoga session, as you are a spin session, as you are running out on the road, to me, then you have true That's fitness. the all-rounder. Yeah, that's, <laughs> no. the, that's the all-rounder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And but. then you can avoid things like overtraining because you are comfortable to do recovery sessions um, and you know how to do a recovery session and you know how to not pound your joints out on the road five days a week because you know how to do other stuff. Yeah, and that's 100%. And the idea behind overtraining is not to say, look, there's this upper ceiling where once you get there, you're going to be overtraining. It's basically saying if you want to get to a high level of training, you need to be realistic, program accordingly, build yourself up bit by bit by bit so that your body can get accustomed to it. And that's what it's that's what it's about. It's about not jumping in the deep end and expecting your body to be okay. It's that bigger picture that you've referred to and that's what when you're programming, that's what you need to think about. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm just having a little giggle because Vicky's just commented um, that that's her about yoga and you know Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, Vicky. <laughs> so we'll be seeing Vicky in a yoga session real soon. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but, you know, oh. it, it is very interesting. I would say that I've got a good base for strength and I've got a good base for cardio at times. Um, but even jumping in to your strength and mobility, I was sore the next day because it's a different style of training. Yeah. And could I do that seven days out of the week straight out of the gate? Maybe not. But I can certainly build my way up to it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I think, yeah, I think the key um, elements that we're taking out with overtraining is, is A, like anything, you need to build your way into things. Um, yep. Make sure that you're getting enough recovery. Make sure that you're looking out for the signs, the symptoms, 
um, if things are maybe not going as planned. So if you are trying to lose weight and you've suddenly reduced your calories and increased your your activity levels and still nothing's happening, well, maybe that's something we need to look at. You know, if you're trying to build muscle mass and the same thing's happening, nothing's going anywhere, we need to look at that. So looking at the signs, the symptoms, making sure that you're aware of different modes of recovery, but I think um, the best thing is to have that long-term vision of, yes, it's okay to have goals. It's absolutely okay to have goals and we encourage it. And, and that's why we strive for, for more is because we've got a goal that we're looking for. But let's start looking at big picture stuff. And I know that I'm probably not getting through to the 18-year-old right now, but look at me. I'm 40 now. <laughs> I'm 40 now and I'm now only just looking at big picture, end game. I don't want to be 60 years old and not able to get off the couch properly and not able to move my body and, and have a body that's, you know, not working properly. So I think the biggest thing is if you want to avoid overtraining and you want a body that works well, it's all about variety and balance. Yeah, and take care of it. Mm. Just take care of it. It is, you only get one body in your life. You can't trade it in for another. And that sounds very grandma-like, but it's so no, true. I feel like a grandma. So listen, I'm 40. <laughs> well, I, com I completely understand. And I think for especially younger girls and younger women, there's a lot of impact that they're experiencing from image. And image is very separate to your health at times so you'll see a lot of images out there of girls that are looking fantastic and perfect weight and da da da, da. Yeah. but they're not healthy and they're not healthy long term so it's really important to just know that you can reach whatever goal you want to reach have the big picture break it up into small chunks of achievable goals work towards it safely and then reap the benefits when you get to the end and you're perfectly functioning as a perfect female and you've reached those goals and you're doing amazing mm. versus the person that's tried to shortcut it and smash their body and then all of a sudden no offense 40 hits and we're, <laughs> we're experiencing some not quite nice feelings so and i think the other thing that i just thought of oh it's time to sing a song Yay! <laughs> oh, what song can I sing? So we've lost Corinne. Maybe we should come up with a jingle. Corinne, Corinne, she's our girl. If she can't do it, no one, Corinne. <laughs> Vicky, I hope you're still watching. Oh, I <laughs> said to you at the beginning, I hope that doesn't happen again. What is it? <laughs> we just made up a jingle. I don't know. <laughs> did you did you hear the jingle? I didn't hear anything. I missed the jingle. Oh, you'll have to watch it back then. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have singing to watch rampage. It back. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a funny feeling it might have something to do with the timer. But anyway, I'm back. Okay, all right. Well, you're back. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was, and it's probably going a little bit off topic, but if you're no. training, <laughs> no, me go off topic never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're training regime, and when we say training, we're really talking about exercising. So exercising, yeah. training, workout, it's all the same thing, right? Yeah. If your training regime is affecting other areas of your life, mm -hmm. so if, um, for example, it's causing um, issues with the harmony at home, if it's starting to affect your routine with work, if other areas of your life you you're starting to miss out on mm -hmm. because of your training regime, mm -hmm. for me that's another big sign that maybe we we haven't got balance. And there's looking after yourself and giving yourself priority, and then there's having it interfere with another element of your life. Yeah, and that that is aside from training, that's probably more an over reliance mm -hmm. um, on training itself. And you do need to have that balance. If that's what's driving you to go because you'll feel guilty if you miss it or you're too anxious. Um, now, obviously, after a workout, you're going to feel amazing. The difference is if you're stuck at home for whatever reason, the car won't work and you can't get to the gym and it destroys your day, mm. then we have a problem. 
And that's something outside of overtraining. And that's probably something that you might need to talk to someone professionally about that so that you can come to terms with why exercise has that effect on you, why it's that important and why such a heavy reliance on it for your own self state. Mm. And that, that is a big thing. And that's separate to overtraining. Um, that's, and you see that a lot and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's completely a normal thing for people when they're experiencing low mood and exercise makes them feel better to become dependent on exercise, but you still need balance. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We're definitely going on tangents now. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) tangents are good. You know, the one thing that I love about these chats is I can feel like I'm talking to you for two minutes, but I've got a little clock up there that tells me it's more like 40. So (laughs) it helps me to understand why (laughs) my time goes by so quickly when I'm hanging out with you. (laughs) Absolutely. Because we, you know, I said in the last chat with Suad that if the viewers were watching and Suad, I did this weird like tangent that we would come back, we promised. (laughs) We promised, yeah. I did see that and it made me laugh because you go off on tangents all the time when we're in the office and then all of a sudden you turn to me and say, Kirsty, and I'm like, oh, (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I'm about to go off on a tangent. (laughs) (laughs) But no, it is lovely to chat. Tangents, we should probably pull up there and save some of our uh, material for our next coffee and conversation. I do want to repeat that if anyone has a jingle that's better than the one that I just missed, I'm sure you might like the one. (laughs) I might like it. I I doubt it. Jingles in. (laughs) Vicky might be wetting her pants at it. (laughs) Vicky, I hope you're there. (laughs) Please send your jingles in. Also, send in your topics that you would like us to cover in coffee and conversation. Um, I did reveal the secret that Deb and I are on next week. We are talking fitness philosophies amazing i can't wait to hear i don't know personal experience fitness philosophies all that sort of stuff i can't wait to hear i'll be i'll be tuned in for sure and i'll expect a jingle okay let me (laughs) let me uh work on that jingle and uh we will see you for coffee well i won't see you but i'll see the facebook peeps for coffee and conversation next week all right thanks for having me all right thanks Christy. see you guys bye Bye.